to kick every episode off by going around the table, which is where we talk about something new, fun, and noteworthy about our weeks. Patrick, I feel like... Oh, man. We want to hear from you. <laughs> it's been a busy one, everybody. <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> it Luke, like did you... <laughs> the Patrick plane was landing. Yeah, well, here's the deal. So I couldn't see you yet. Like, I was looking at the camera to do the intro, and I still had, like, the script and stuff in front of the cameras. So all I started hearing was, uh... <laughs> Do you think he was timbering off his chair? Yeah, it is weird. It, it, this week has just been too much. It seems like every week is just, you know, you always do that whole, it'll be better next week. It's not. Um, but, you know, we're getting ever closer to California and to Texas and uh, reimagine. I'm like super uh, close to Texas. Well, yeah. <laughs> it, it just to post, it, reimagine um, crop BR. I'm sorry. Uh, pop up crop Mondo Con. Like it is right around the corner. That is the one thread of hope that I have. Um, but this week, a lot of cool stuff happening. I think the biggest thing since we talked last is I actually did get to play Clank for the first time. Yeah. Talked about on the show. I, I might have been two weeks ago at this point. Read it Secret Santa, that, right? Exactly. That I, I, a Secret Santa gifted it to me. Yeah. Uh, and I, I expressed a little bit of disappointment when I unboxed it just because it, it didn't quite help the quality of some of the other games that, uh, as far as like texture and feel and, and board looking stuff of some other games that I, that I own or we've so, shown on the show before. Yeah. Um, but I knew it was reviewed well. I was excited to play it and it absolutely did not disappoint. So now it is only for four people. Thankfully, we only had four people. So I didn't have to, you know, let a couple other people down. Like, um, hey, but, thanks for coming over. Sit over in this chair and watch us. Yeah, we'll talk to you later. Um, at, but it was a, a total blast. I mean, oh my gosh, the game was a ton of fun. I can see where uh strategies can be all over the place there's not going to be like a a one guaranteed way to to win the game yeah uh the play can be pretty quick depending on your strategy i mean within a half hour we on the other hand we we were learning when we played so i think it took us two and a half hours to make it through like learning the rules and and doing the first play sure cannot wait uh to pick it up again so it's it's just absolutely a lot of fun love the game i cannot recommend it enough um you know, it's it's very highly reviewed by the, by all the you know huge community of board game geek. Yeah. Uh, for good reason. So if you haven't played the game, if you're looking to pick up another one, Clank is going to be a winner. Absolute home run. Um, <laughs> that's kind of been the big thing. I mean, we other than that, somehow I ended up dog sitting for several days and like. You know, I I basically but just you been, hate dogs. It's terrible. So I basically Not as much been as he like hates kids. There, some he, they're here. So you know, it it is what it is. Most so kids I, are down here. I, I was going to say that's a, a tall dog and child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. So anyway, so the the point is, Clank is about all of my pop culture experiences for the for the past week or so. Um, I haven't made out to any movies. Uh, got to finish up a couple yeah. shows, but it's all stuff we talked about on the podcast before. So so you still I, haven't seen Mother? No, no, no. And in, in fact. I was scheduled to go see it and um, we like mixed up our record times or did something. And Oh, we were going to record um, this. This was like la- last week, week before I can't uh, remember. Yeah. We were going to record one day later. We ended up bumping up the record a day. Right. And then I had to back out. I was scheduled to go see it that night. So the next, my next watch will be American made. That's the one that I'm excited about. Mm. Uh, great reviews. It looks awesome. Uh, between that. And then I think battle of the sexes. I think those King's are the two I'm talking about right now. And huh? Kingsman 2? I'm just I, I will say I let the reviews get to me a bit, so I might hold off a bit. Kingsman 2 oh. seems like I could maybe say that wait. for just wait, because I'm talking about it for my master pleasure. category. Totally. So, yeah. Well, go and take over around the table, Andrew. What have you been up to? Okay. I think I did the exact opposite of you. <laughs> like I think I like before we started, I think this was even before you logged on, Patrick. I showed Luke the stack, the literal stack of things that I heard I've Luke go, oh, you can't possibly talk about all of that. Yeah, yeah. Luke uh scolded me and so now no, I'm gonna talk about one thing. I think that you had as, enough air capacity in your lungs to talk about all of it. <laughs> Hair yeah. capacity. Um, better me than Patrick, though, because otherwise we'd just be getting a lot of, like, air burps. It's true. So it's true. We, I'm working we, uh, on it, though. We, like, I've had, like, a ton of pop culture, like, just jammed down my throat the last couple of weeks. Um, Are you okay? We haven't, we haven't done this in, like, eight days. Yeah, right? I don't even right. know who you guys are. 
This is like the opposite of what, what happened last time, which is where we jammed a bunch of episodes all together. Now we're on our normal schedule, our new schedule. So this is, we're like, it's weird. You're wearing a hat. It looks good. like it's like 15 years old or something. It's crazy. I know. It's crazy. So, yeah, that's true. So, um, just I'm, I'm going to run through a couple of things that I got. I'm not going to go into in, in depth on any of them. And I'm going to save some other stuff because honestly, I just can't do spend it. any more money go. to do it. So, um, I got this guy from, um, from Think Geek. Oh, I know that guy. Which, uh, yeah, this is this is Mickey Mouse. Hopefully, uh, it looks a little blown out on the camera just because uh, of the white balance situation. But he is die cast, so he is metal. Ooh. Um, and man, his his colors are like uh, they're great. He's yeah. shiny and he's Sorcerer Mickey. If you're if you're just listening to this, if you want a visual, head over to our YouTube channel and see. But he's great. He uh, they unveiled him at D twenty three and his hit his uh, waist pivots. But that's it. He doesn't have any his other arms. Don't move. Um, no, he doesn't have any points. He's he's essentially a statue. Okay. Well, he um, has a point of articulation. So there's nothing point. like that causes the pivot beyond you holding him and just like. He's not motorized. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. I didn't know if it was like hula, his like hip shaking Mickey or something. No, no, no. He's got like but a the, solar the design, sensor. The design is actually really, really good. Like, yeah. it looks great. Um, it looks so, awesome. Uh, so I actually ended up picking up one of these for our good friend uh, Jay Ratner because nice. he wanted one, and they had, and you can't find these just anywhere, which is cool. But it's a secret, so don't tell him. Yeah. I mean, he knows because he uh, paid me for it. So, um, oh, but then okay. I remember last a uh, couple weeks ago, I showed you that I got uh, Scrooge McDuck. Yeah, yeah. I I picked up uh, this week. I picked up Launchpad to go Launch with him. Launchpad McQuack. And nice. Launchpad McQuack it looks, looks good. he looks great. Yeah, I'm just I'm loving how the, like the way that they're doing the beaks with a couple of these guys. Like the plat, you can tell that the vinyl that it's cast in is that. Yeah. And so it's it's not just painted on. I'm trying to get it to focus on the camera. Sure. Yeah. There we go. So, um, but I I love how that that came out. And then, um, so on the 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 thread of of Disney yep. and art. Yep. Um, I got from uh dis the Disney artist the uh. Disney Animation Artist Showcase. That what they've been doing is they've been releasing like um, side projects by some of their artists. Okay. Um, and so they've they've written or illustrated or both um, projects. And so I picked up this book, which is called Catch My Breath, um, which is so so that fun looks and like, so cute. Did, did you ever read the the kids book or um, see Harold in the Purple Crayon? Uh, no. Okay, so that style that animation style looks very very similar to that book so the the, the purpose of or the point of this book and here's you know i'll just give you a quick gl glimpse of it um the point of this book mm, is this that looks this like me this child um the mom like he's running around and the mom says uh you better catch your breath. And that like really confuse that colloquialism kind of confuses the kid a little bit. And so he starts imagining where his breath may go. And so he's literally chasing after it. He's mm. trying to catch his breath in right. all these different scenarios. It's a lot of fun. It's really cute, but it's by Paul Briggs. Um, and he's a Disney animator uh, and artist. So uh, ch check out that book. If that's uh, something that you're excited about nice. um, the, the color of Pixar. I got this book. I've had my eye on this book for a long what time. But if you look it? at the, do you see the binding? Yeah. yeah. So every single page of this book. Oh yeah. Goes, I've seen this book. I'm gonna try to do this and not uh, hit the microphone. But every page of this book has a different scene mm -hmm. from a different Pixar film. Yeah. And it goes through the entire gamut of the rainbow. Yeah. So each page is slightly a slightly different shade of the page before. Yeah. And so, uh, but they're all scenes from Pixar films mm -hmm. that have that color as the dominant mood color. It's like a massive mood book. Um, yeah. So it's really really cool. Uh, and the forward is by John Lasseter, obviously, because he's a freaking who's that Pixar legend. <laughs> uh, it's Allison Lasseter's cousin. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not. Allison Lester's nah. cousin. And then this is the last thing I'll share. I got several more things. But this is the last thing I'll share. It just came out, just released um, this week. Uh, and I pre-ordered this a long time ago, too. But it's the Over the Garden Wall, the art of the Over the Garden Wall. Oh. And it's got, like, this this foil. I can see if I can get the is camera to show leaf? it. It's got this foil, like, uh, inlay. 
You see that? Yeah. Oh, man. It's like really, really nice. And it's big and it's hardcover and it's bound really well. Um, let me see if I can find a, a good example of the page here real quick for you guys. Because neither one of you have watched this yet, right? So you no. don't. So this is, here's a cool example um, of a page where there, it has like scene, like uh, scenery and stuff like that, where mm -hmm. you see the mood of like the sets and things. But then there's also character development pages. Oh, nice. Yeah. Wow. So if you own any of these like art of books, uh -huh. um, this is a really, really good one to have on the shelf. The fact that it's got that foil on it and uh, just the it's just great. Um, what other so things do people use these books for? Like, do people buy them to use them as like, let's say, reference if they want to learn to draw in a similar way? Yeah, probably. Yeah, it would make sense. Yeah. If you wanted to use it that way. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a good, a good cool. way to use it. But it's it's really cool. It's it's really good, especially if you're if you're um, if you're trying to learn animation or you're trying to learn uh, character development or set development or whatever. It's good because it walks you through the notes. Yeah. Um, from the directors and art directors and um, the artists and the, like the back and, and forth. Right. Like this is good. Change this. Tighten this up. It has like that kind of stuff. Um, I haven't gotten, I don't know that this one has that. Some of them do. Like right. some of the ones I have with Kevin Eastman, it's got his notes between him and Peter Laird and it does mm -hmm. that. I don't know if this does that. Sure. Um, everyone's just a little bit different, but it definitely shows like, it'll show a concept page and then you'll see notes from somebody like, hey, this needs to go here. Or this character needs to be more or whatever. So sure. it's it's really, really neat. Um, and then I got a couple of other things, uh, some that we're going to touch base um, later in the episode on, so I'm just going to leave it at that for now. So, Luke, why don't you take it? Yeah, uh, that oh, book would also Luke be yeah. good at uh, killing big spiders if you have any of those around your house. The yes. Pixar book. Right. Or, yeah. or the Over the Garden Wall book. Honestly, any of the books that I got because they're all massive uh, hardcover books. Right, yeah. I have a hammer. Spider killers. Um, okay, so... Are you just looking around the room and saying things you have? <laughs> yeah, I have a hammer. I was just... That, that would work. <laughs> Okay, cool. I love lamp. <laughs> um, so I was, uh, I don't even remember how I, how I got into looking through uh, Mama Sauce's client list um, last week, but I did, and I found a company. Uh, they did. Nick Sambrato. Yeah, Nick Sambrato uh, of Mama Sauce. I, I looked through their client list because they always put uh, kind of like, here's people we work with. Here's an idea of the project. And sometimes they have the price so you can get an idea of like, if you're going to be printing and it's similar to this, here's what you might be looking at depending on. And I think that's a cool thing to do to your site. But I saw a pin on there um, by a company called um, Pretty Useful. And this is the pin back that uh, Mama Sauce did for them. It's it's pretty oh, wow. cool and intricate. I'm trying to get the other camera to focus on it. Um, pretty sweet. But it's this pin now, here's the hard part. If this doesn't translate in uh, video, I'm sorry. It's a round pin with a D20 um, on it. It's affixed to it. And the cool thing is that it spins. So you can spin it to roll a die, uh, roll, you know, like roll the die. Um, and it's, uh, it says roll higher die. And it, it kind of says that around the edges. Uh, and then it has, uh, Pretty. Roll high or die. Or die, yeah. Gotcha. Um, and it's got a skull and then a one at the top, and, it, and that one, uh, the arrow uh, points to whatever number it lands on. So it's a really fun design. I thought it was a really clever idea for a pin, and I, I wanted to see really how it worked. Um, it's very cool. It spins a lot better when it's laying flat than it does when it's up straight how it would be on apparel. So I think that's a little sure. bit of a weird... Uh, probably, I mean, this is probably a fairly hard thing to design and manufacture. So good on them for it. Definitely even trying seems it. a little bit more like like it's a little bit more of a novelty. Than yeah, it absolutely. Be a yeah, anyway, it's not so. supposed to be a like you put a, a ball bearing in there to work great. Right, like this is not. I'm not going to bring this to D and D and be like, here's my D20 for the night because uh, it because they'll won't laugh work. at you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's really cool. Now here's one beef that I have with this. All of it to say, very cool design. Fun. I love it. I will be uh, wearing it. Um, I have a little bit of a beef. So any D20 that you get, it's a 20-sided die. On the opposite, the direct opposite of the D20 is the one. And that's the dichotomy of a critical failure and a critical success. The dichotomy? Yeah, no, you're doing great. 
Um, so this pin. Because it's like a dice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this pin, the 20 is at the top, and it's it's segmented. Um, directly across from it is not the one. Directly across is from it? it is the five. Mm. And I feel like that they were just um, using nerd culture to sell some pins. I mean, it's a, it's a fun idea, but I feel like there was like this little step of homework that could have been done to really uh, make the design true. Um, and they didn't do it. And that's kind of frustrating and kind of a bummer for me. So... I really like the design. I was super excited to get it. I and you're got it. Throw the pin away. No, I got it, and it's just it could He's have been. He's gonna keep the pin backer. It could have been just perfect. Chunk the pin, and and now it's just okay. So it's wait, wait, wait. So it's ten percent off. I, I realized that you were talking about this before we started recording, and I realized now I misunderstood everything. Yeah. Is there? We knew that you misunderstood in the moment. Though. So just to be fair, it's fine. you're the only one who this is news to. <laughs> is there any type of order to it so i mean it's not uh, like they no. put one through 20 in like order well they're all they're all off of what they should be so like that's what that's what you're saying right Patrick? yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah yeah, yeah they're not they're they just randomly put on they're there. just they, randomly they put in it's it's like they just put in a generator and had it fill that's around lazy. a circle and it that's just what they went with. They didn't actually look at an actual D20 to say, okay, opposite of the two is a 19. Opposite of a 14 is a seven. And you could probably sand them off. No. No. I nope. mean, yes, you're right. You probably could. You probably could. Okay. I'm not going to okay. do that. What Patrick's saying is you are the master of your own domain at this point. Like, if you want it to be perfect, it's on you. Yeah, I'm right. saying to, to feel the need is to hear the call. I think that's what this is a great example of. Yeah. Oh, can we can we uh, coin you as having said that? Yeah. yeah. Me and uh, – actually, I'm quoting Michael Scott. Did you say feel the, the need, the need for speed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this um, speed doesn't go below 50 miles an hour. All right. Yeah. Anyway, we jumped the shark here. Uh, so yeah, it was a cool pin. So Do a little bit more them. homework before you just try and appropriate nerd culture for income. Um, the other thing is a new D and D book, Tomb of Annihilation, came out. So this uh, is a brand new adventure for uh, level one to eleven characters. I will be DMing this campaign uh, in about a month, and so I'm super excited for that. Gonna hop so back you, if you want to join his guy. If you want to join his online guild, go to uh, www.lukesthebest.org slash what was it? Slash beard face. Yeah, <laughs> sure. Is. Let's go with that. Yeah. Patrick, go ahead, can internet. You get that domain. Make that happen. <laughs> you <laughs> know. <laughs> by the way, I will say because the holidays are surprisingly not that far away. <laughs> LukeInAsantaSuit.com is still a it's thing. It's there. It's a thing. Just so you know. It Do is... we own it? Oh, yeah. Hey, Jonathan we don't own owns it. it. Jonathan owns it. Yeah. Jake but, yeah oh, that's right. Yeah. Yes. It's a, good, oh. it's a thing. Yeah, it's there. Oh, yeah. Luke in a Santa suit is still alive yeah. and kicking. Yeah. If you want to go check As it out. As well it should be. Uh, I'm going to look it up right now. <laughs> but, um, Necessary. But yeah, Tomb of Annihilation. It uh, takes place in a new like jungle area with dinosaurs and stuff. Pretty awesome. It's going to be fun. But that was my Which week. One? That's it. Is it .com? I think it is. I don't know. Isn't uh, it Luke in a Santa suit? Oh, here we go, my, guys. My this keyboard is sounds radio. like a mach machine gun. It really does. Luke in a Santa Suit. This was this was the 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 Christmas present for Mark Bowden, I think, right? Am I rem remembering this correctly? It's not uh, dot io, it's not dot com, and it's not dot org. Maybe it's like, oh gosh, we have to find it. Yeah, yeah, we do. Maybe it's like see Luke in a Santa suit. Hey, maybe or... maybe this, maybe this. Hey, Mark, I believe this was Mark Bowden. I think it was. I think it was Mark. His, his Christmas present. Post it. Post it in the, the comments below on our YouTube page, and yeah. you can find it and go go there to do it. Yeah. Um, um, but man. Yeah, that was fun. But that was my week. So it's pretty much D&D themed uh, besides work. So Awesome. I have messaged everyone I know to get an answer to that right now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, that's it for our Around the Table. Up next, we're going to talk about some master categories. But first, Calculated Comics with Kolb. <laughs> 
So one of the regular segments that we have on our show is when we get to talk to our good friend from the North, Andrew Kolb, for his regular segment called Calculated Comics with Kolb. So everybody give a warm welcome to Mr. Andrew Kolb. Hi. That wasn't as good. Welcome back. Uh, when, when I said his actual name that time and didn't say, call know. him Andrew I Cold. Everybody yeah. got deprived of a warm welcome to Mr. Cold. That's okay. all. That's fine. Mr. Cold. Um, That's right. So, Andrew, welcome to the uh, the new video version of the show. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, everyone who's watching this will know whether or not it all worked out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But in theory, I'm being recorded right That's now, both there. video and audio. <laughs> If you're seeing this, it worked. If you're exactly. just hearing this, uh, better luck next time. So uh, <laughs> yeah. it's been a bit since we've chatted with you. Uh, so we want to we want to get down to business and talk about your your category. But then we've got some other business to to tend to that you've had some cool stuff come out. So why don't we start with your with your uh, calculated comics portion? Mm-hmm. Sure. So, uh, as per usual, I will need a number either one, two, or three from each of you. Three. Great. One. Excellent. Three. Ooh. Oh, another new number. I know yes! you're always worried about. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is great. Uh, although I still have to find it. Okay. Three, one, three. Um, that is. How can have you, you show lost us? this? <laughs> I was going to say, can you show us what your matrix looks like? <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. So just real quick. I think that's going to be on camera. Oh, my God. Uh, so that's like so my awesome. grid and then my notes. Goodness, um, you take this more seriously than we do. Yeah, you're so much more <laughs> professional than we are. Okay, so 313 is, um, actually, I think we've, well, we'll get there. Uh, so this is called Farfed and the Grey Mouser. Uh, I'm going to spell that out for you. Um, it's F-A-F-H-R-D. Uh, and then gray mouser, like the shade of gray. And then uh-huh. someone who catches mice. Um, How did you pronounce is, that first name? Ooh, I mean, uh, well, <laughs> upon reflection, <laughs> wrong. Um, so maybe Fafford? I don't okay. know. I, don't I know. believe whatever I, you I'm gonna say right you. now. I'm going to trust you. Okay, great. I think I was throwing in an extra R or moving it into the wrong spot the first time. Uh, F-A-F-H-R-D. I'm going to say Fafford. Okay. F- maybe it's Fared. Do you know what? I think there's some Gaelic in it. Maybe it's Fared. I think it's probably Fared. Yep. It looks great. Yep. Well, I was doing it phonetically for anyone who's just listening. So, yeah, no, Fared good. and the Grey Moser. Um, <laughs> so, it was, so, it's a comic that was based off of um, an old uh, series of uh, kind of pulpy fan- high fantasy stories by Fritz Lieber. Um, but it's illustrated by, or at least the pencils were done by Mike Mignola. So, this was mm. some of Mike's, uh, or I shouldn't be on a first name base, uh, like Mignola's <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mignola's. Like early work. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> So it was Mike Mignola's earlier work, uh, and then there were um, other artists who were doing the color and the writing as well. Um, but it's kind of like the kind of classic high fantasy, like sword and sorcery. Um, Fared is like a barbarian, and then the Grey Mouser is a rogue, um, if you're kind of using D&D terms. Uh, totally so it in. just kind of follows I don't even know what's uh, about, some of their adventures. Sorry, Luke? I, I don't even know what it's about, but I'm in. Like it, I'm oh there. yeah, it's it's fun. I didn't either. All I knew is like Mike McDola and the kind of premise of the comic, and and it, it delivered. Like it's it's kind of old like Conan the Barbarian fantasy of just like they've already been, especially in these comics, they've already been partners for years. They like they, you, you can tell that they've had a number of adventures that we're not privy to, mm-hmm. um, which is fun. Like we're just kind of like thrown in mid adventure, um, and that's and that's it. Man, it looks cool. Uh, That's awesome. I mean, anything Magnola, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna check out, and uh, I like the idea of it being like that, that period, um, like fantasy piece, kind of like that. Uh, it's like it looks kind of quintessentially, uh, um, I, I the the immediate. This isn't this isn't great, but the immediate thought I go to is like Princess Bride, kind of. Oh um, yeah. Yeah, I think the the tone is definitely a bit darker, but I think the yeah. kind of spirit of it, like that's if, what I mean, if, yeah, yeah, that 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 period, I guess, is what I what I would say, Mid- medievally, but not perfect. quite medieval. I'm yeah. realizing I have a really poor understanding of Magnola's style because this, like, is this more uh, signature of his work? 
No, I would say because no. this is early work, um, I actually have a couple of other comics where he just did the pencils. Uh, and okay. I think, if I remember correctly, I think he just did the pencils for this. So you'll see it in the compositions and in the proportions of the characters. Um, but because he wasn't inking them at this point, or at least I don't think he was, um, you don't have that high, high contrast and those kind of right. large, flat blacks that you see in his right. Hellboy and some of his later work. Um, so, yeah, if you kind of want to see, not necessarily where he started out, obviously he had like a large body work before he got to this, but pre-Hellboy Mignola, uh, this is definitely a good kind of uh, example of that. He has so, done some of the, there's some of the covers he did the coloring of, and you can tell there's like a major discrepancy between his color and ink stuff and and the others mm. yeah like, it's just think, a lot more flat I, colors yeah and i think with the covers those were probably done either later or redone as he gained uh, notoriety yeah. like i think it was probably a passion project or like it was definitely a small run series that was released uh like you'd get any other kind of regular monthly or weekly comic um but it was collected once kind of mignola became like capital M Mignola. Um, so I think he probably went back, did the covers and had established. This was my, like, this was his signature style. Uh, and that's why admittedly, if you look at the covers, it's not going to be perfect reflection of the interior, but, uh, it's, it's still Mignola's work. Like, especially if you're a fan of it, you'll see, you'll see the like human proportions. You'll see a lot of the just general layouts still match kind of what he was doing in Hellboy. So yep. I, ha- I have a question. I am not a fan of the look of this at all. I do. I okay. just do not like this. And but earlier in this episode, I mentioned um, a game Clank. I've talked about it twice on the show now about how I wasn't necessarily a fan of the look and feel of it. But then I played it and it was great fun. Just awesome. Okay. And so, you know, that that kind of became like it kind of forgave it. So when you're getting into something like this and maybe not this specifically, but. I'm assuming that you own or have read comics or, or graphic novels that you really just haven't liked the style of, but maybe the story was really engrossing and that's all, and that's all it took. And at that point you were just locked. How do you, how do you get there? Like, how do you allow yourself to like forgive, like maybe something in the art style to get to the point of, you know, appreciating for story in this case? It's hard because you're saying that I just finished a comic that I bought the like first trade uh, and couldn't get past the art style. So I like I like the writer. Um, We've talked. Oh, Umbrella Academy. So I liked Gerard Way's work uh, and I like his writing and his world building. Um, But this new imprint, he just uh, started doing work with DC uh, and I liked the idea of the character. But couldn't get past the art style. It just wasn't for me. Um, so in that s- situation, the story would really have to blow me away, um, which this didn't. Like, it was a good story, but it wasn't enough to compensate. Um, so I don't know if I have, like, a good answer of how to overcome that. Like, I think comics are both. It's it's not just a novel where you can imagine it however you want. Like, I think yep. you have to be on board with the visuals as well. Mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, it's just as bad as if something looks great, but the writing is awful. So I think if it's not for you, that's totally okay. Um, But I think if you're open to or if you're into kind of like classic fantasy stories, um, uh, like a light Lord of the Rings, Conan the Barbarian, uh, like I think um, Princess Bride is a perfect touchstone for the kind of like vibe of it. There's still some humor. It's maybe a bit more serious than that. But if that's the kind of writing you like, then maybe it will be enough to overcome. But if not, I completely support uh, visual tastes as much as kind of literary ones. So speaking of writing, uh, matching up with the art, uh, you have a new book that you wrote and illustrated that just came out (laughs) this week, right? Yeah, Um, it sure did. So I'm going to show it. You talk about it. Uh, Okay, well, yeah, Andrew is holding up, uh, for the uh, people who are just listening, holding up a copy of my second picture book uh, called Les and Ronnie Step Out. Um, It's a children's picture book, much in the same vein as Edmund and Ravel's. It's maybe like a spiritual successor. Um, In that, it's like happy kind of... uh, low-key uh genial illustrations but the message being kind of it's important to consider someone else's point of view uh to best kind of communicate and get along so 
uh, I guess maybe that's not the best elevator pitch. The elevator pitch is it's about a left leg and a right leg, um, less being the straight laced and sensible type Ronnie being the kind of more free spirited one. Um, and through a series of events, they kind of have to relate to each other on their terms and kind of walk a mile in each other's shoes, uh, to kind of connect. So how fun was it drawing all of those shoes? Like, was there a point where you're like, I can't even imagine another style of shoe. Yeah, and, and that was the, I mean, if anything, I found the kind of uh, simple shoes of Les's wardrobe to be harder uh, because it's 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 easy to make one a lizard shoe and one a high-heeled, like, razor shoe. Mm. But after five or six kind of, like, generic loafers, what do you do to make this one still feel like he, he, they needed to get another shoe? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I could still draw the crazy shoes endlessly um but if you give me another kind of like tennis shoe to draw i'd I'd probably pass it up (laughs) so we've read it in our family already we love it it's a great counterpart to edmund unravels they both kind of have these morals you know to the these these moral elements to it which is great not like good and bad morals but like they have these points to them at the end if you kind of watch the thread all the way through it (laughs) uh pun intended but um but this is great. Um, on top of this one, you also had uh, this come out, which you didn't write, but you did the illustrations for. Um, talk about this one while I show people. Great. Yeah, that one. Uh, so that's called uh, Andrew's holding up another book called All Aboard, Let's Ride a Train. Um, and this one is uh, less of a narrative driven book and more kind of like a, an experiential I don't know, Andrew, how would you describe it? It's you know, like a... I, I don't even know. It, it's fun. <laughs> like, that's what I would say. I'm great. It, it is a six foot wingspan. Like the book wow. literally opens up to six Very feet. Cool. Um, it's a train. It's a board book. I want and, it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it gives you like um, activity. It's like activity based, like to, to look for and try to track down different things in the book. But there is like one overarching theme um if you will and i won't i won't give anything away but essentially the you're, train? you're trying to, you're trying to find <laughs> no, something even, with, even within the train patrick within um, the train there's one oh, character yeah, each, there's one yeah. character that you see in every scene and you're trying to help that character do something um right. but it's so i mean it's so you it's like quintessentially andrew cole um every bit of it looks like you uh it it feels like if you own anything of, of Andrews, especially in any of your newer work, this it oh. is like it's right on right on and it's like produced really well. Whoever did yeah. the production of this stuff is super, super nice. Like it's good. If you yeah, have Abrams kids was Oh sorry, go ahead. It was Abrams that you said? Oh yeah, Abrams. Yeah. Yeah, so if you have kids, pick up both of these. I managed to uh, accidentally buy two of the Les and Ronnie book, which is fine because I think now our our uh, listeners and watchers can uh, benefit from that. I'm going to give away a copy of it. All you have to do is leave a comment below in the YouTube uh, on the YouTube video um, and uh, like and share the video and subscribe. Um, and I will pick random, uh, just a random uh, comment on that. So um, it doesn't necessarily have to be about the book. It can be, hey, I, w- I want to win the book. It can be, hey, this episode's great. Hey, uh, why is Andrew Kolb so much more handsome than you guys? It can literally be anything. <laughs> or, hey, what happened to Andrew Kolb's video? <laughs> or that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, 100%. Just leave a comment if you want to win a copy of this, uh, and I will send it to you. It's They're great, man. Um, yeah. I know Patrick doesn't have kids, and this is just about on his reading level. Um, and so it's literally <laughs> I will something go for anybody. find a scholastic book fair right now to get this book. <laughs> oh, yeah. man, that would be my dream. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, tell everybody where they can find you, where they can connect with what you're doing, and uh, they can, can buy all of your great stuff. Sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm Andrew. No, well, I'm, I am Andrew Kolb, <laughs> but on social media, I am Kolb is neat everywhere. Um, and I'm also like a pretty like ghostly presence in the Slack community, but pretty much if you say, my, if you comment my name three times, I appear yeah. immediately. You're um, the bloody Mary of the Slack. Community. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, so I'm active on the Slack if you ever have any questions or, I mean, if you read any of the comics that I talk about, 
vote. I would love either more recommendations or to tell me what you think. Because, uh, I mean, obviously we get to chat about it, but it's also cool to kind of hear others kind yeah. of come back from yeah. from this. Uh, so I know it's still worthwhile doing. <laughs> and not that yeah, I'm like, uh, get past the comics. <laughs> so, we have had somebody, uh, <laughs> we have had somebody literally in the last uh, 48 hours say, when is the next episode with Andrew Cole? Uh, so yes, that's true. true, 100%. Well, so. this is it. Um, so yeah, that's me, Andrew Cole. But Cole was neat everywhere on social media, email, tweet, Instagram, uh, whatever you need to do. Dial awesome. Cole was neat on your cell phone and it won't go anywhere. Yeah, it'll uh, be great. No, oh. <laughs> no I will. Uh, Someday. Well, dude, as always, it's been great to see you and hopefully the world has now seen you and uh, we will talk again very soon. I hope so too, and let's, I'm excited to see how this transitions out. Like, I don't know if it's a wipe. Like, do you do a Star Wars like fade <laughs> You're down? You're already gone by now. We transitioned out. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we transitioned your video before I we started plugging uh, your books. <laughs> all right, as long as it's not like as long as you haven't like CG'd or like imposed something else, like a wave washing over me, and I'm gone. So uh, that's awesome. Anyway, Star thanks wipe. for having me. Yeah. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Or the brick wall from the old. Uh, we're fine. I don't it's, know if we anyway. can afford it. <laughs> we can afford a star wipe. So the master categories every week are the time we get to talk about the tokens we drew the week before, which give us the categories. Then we pick our topics based on those categories. And I think Patrick, maybe we'll let you start this off. I would love to. Mine is going to be a doozy. So let me say this. We, we are not a controversial show that is by design. The intention is not to, like, ruffle feathers and, like, challenge people's strongly held beliefs about things. Nope. Uh, unless it's creative re related. But we're not trying to, like, dig up politics and stuff like that. But I want to talk about something I heard this week, and I want to pose a question. I don't even know that I'm looking for an answer. I just want to use this time to talk about something and pose a question that is the setup for it. Okay. I am intrigued. Me too, because Thank I know you. what your topic is, so I'm really confused as to how we get there. So let's do this. Okay, so I have, for some reason, my life has been um, exposed, is not the word I want to use in this case, and you'll know in a second why, to Dove Charney lately through like three different mediums. So there's a couple of events that have happened, um, and then there was a book that I was reading that spoke about him, and then I listened to season four of the startup podcast by Gimlet. And they all talk about this character, Dove Charney. Dove Charney is the individual that uh, founded American Apparel. Um, okay. In Los Angeles. Okay. And made everything in Los Angeles and uh, grew it to be, uh, according to him, I, uh, in its peak, nearly, if not a billion dollar company. It's a lot of money. Before ultimately getting pushed out by a board of directors, and then the company's now filed bankruptcy twice. He, um, uh, other than his assets, does not have any money in the bank, and he's actually starting a new company now, which is uh, similarly titled Southern LA America. Apparel. Oh, okay. Yes. So it, it is apparel, but he's back to the wholesale business. So let me uh, dive into a bit more of the Dove Charney uh, story. So, um, and, and let me say this, startup podcast I had never listened to before. I was aware of it. And uh, this is produced by Gimlet Media. And, um, and in fact, I think it's sometimes called the Gimlet Startup Podcast. Great show. I mean, it, it plays like listening to something like Serial or something like that. But what they do is they take someone who has a startup, who's starting a business, and they basically just follow them for a year or some amount of time and talk about their challenges, their experiences, what they're dealing with, uh, yada, yada, yada. The Dove Charney, that's season four, and specifically I think it's episodes four through ten, something like that. It's the first three episodes are mini and they're about Gimlet, four through ten. It's a bit of a unique story because at this point Dove had already had a billion dollar company. I mean, that's insane. So so the idea of a startup, LA Apparel's a startup, but Dove himself has, you know, he's he's already done it. He had already right. been there, and now he's doing it again. Okay, so the rise and fall. So I'm going to go through this quickly so I can get to my question because I'm very excited. So for those that don't know, I mentioned that Dove was pushed out of American Apparel by a board of directors. Now, the reason is that he may or may not have 
Um, nothing has been uh, necessarily, he hasn't been convicted of anything, but he has paid out millions of dollars to settle a bunch of sexual harassment cases. I mean, we're talking like dozens of cases. That's okay. Not good. No, 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 not good. That's All right? bad for business, for the record, if anybody is one. Yeah. Honestly, it, you, it doesn't matter what business it is. Yeah. Any business. It's when bad. you are a publicly traded company, you do not want your CEO uh, at any given point literally sleeping with dozens and dozens of employees and racking up dozens of sexual harassment lawsuits. It, it's sure. just the whole thing is craziness. Like, and, and when you listen, and again, I can't recommend this season of Startup Podcast enough. Uh, they, they, go really in depth with the explanation and, and, and like um, hit on all the different sides to it and aspects. Is and the whole season him? Is The whole season oh. is devoted to him. Yeah. All oh, of okay. season four. I missed that wait. part. I missed that the whole season of the, okay. It's just Dove Charney and it's about LA Apparel, but the reality is they talk about LA Apparel for a grand total of 10 minutes over the course of like six hours or whatever it is. Okay. So anyway, he was ultimately ousted because... He was going to, his behavior was going to sink the company, basically. Like, you, you, that, that, that is not the guy you want to have around. Yes, he built the company, but once you're a publicly traded company worth a billion dollars, that's not something you can tolerate, especially if the behavior becomes more and more outrageous. Now, there is a very, so I'm not going to give away the season, watch it, but in the last episode, there's a great line, and a guy is talking, and this guy is actually a wholesaler, and he makes the comment that he's being asked about how will public opinion of Dove change if he's able to build another billion dollar business. Because with that going on, the separate part of that is American Apparel uh, employed 10,000 people. It did not offshore any of its um, production. Right. It's, it's a truly American Apparel. That's what kind of made it. No, right. it was truly American Apparel because he wanted to micromanage all the processes. But the fact is it was. He paid all those workers full wages. Like he's paying you know, people to sew $14 an hour while someone else in another part of the world is getting paid 50 cents an hour. Sure. Okay. So he paid those right. people full wages. So, so that being said, if he, if he's able to build another big company, this guy was being asked, how will public opinion change if he brings another 10,000 jobs to the Los Angeles area? And the guy's response was that money forgives all something along those lines. Um, I'm not saying that that's appropriate, but I think it's a great quote. So and, and Patrick's new mantra is money forgives all. So this kind of brings me to the question. And I realize I haven't really gone in depth about Dove, but I feel like I've given enough to pose this question. And again, I'm not looking for an answer because I think I'm going to be thinking about this for a while. But I, I thought about some less extreme cases. I thought about someone like Steve Jobs, who is, had a reputation for having the ability to be horrible to a person. For just like tearing someone apart and tearing someone down. However, and not to mention like uh, the, there's the stories of even how his business relationships turned out and, and all those type of things. However, because the man was a genius or because a huge company was built in the process, that is okay. You know, I am in a startup culture where we have a lot of, frankly, these new CEOs and, and just high level people that feel like they have permission to treat people poorly because they feel like that that's, that's how Steve jobs did it. And then if you're a genius, then you can do it and you can get away with it. Now move this over to American apparel. We have someone like Dove Charney who is literally destroying dozens of people's lives, but he created 10,000 jobs and he employed people and gave them a fair wage that no one else was doing that with. And he's an advocate for this underserved community, whatever it is. My question is, where is that line? Where is the line where it's okay if you do this bad, if you do this percentage of good, because we are in a culture again, I think Steve Jobs is a great example of someone that we absolutely exalt even though the way he treated people is in like not just questionable, but in many cases just downright bad. And so I, I that is like my personal question to myself that I walked away. I just walked away from listening to this season of startup feeling very conflicted and understanding where boundaries lie in the weight of like a, a 
cultural or global good versus like a personal evil. So that's where it is. Hmm. It's a huge question. It's it's that I'm not solving anything, but I just felt very conflicted. Again, great season. Uh, definitely worth a listen. I hope that you walk away with it with more clarity than I did because it kind of messed up my mind for a bit. So do you guys have any thoughts? Nope. Um, <laughs> I don't think... Man. Yeah, I don't have a fully formed thought, but I'll just yeah, say what I'm thinking. Yeah, that's exactly why. That's yeah, fine. Like, I don't I'll have say a... what I'm thinking. I don't care. Um, it's, not, it's not a one good... It's not a balancing thing. You can celebrate a good somebody does, but you also have to admonish the bad that they do. Like what he was doing to other people with uh, like um, all of the sexual harassment allegations, whether or not they're true or not, um, that's bad. The, the job side and, and keeping everything uh, in America and creating jobs, that's good. There's good and bad. It doesn't mean if you do enough good, it outweighs your bad. Or if you do enough bad, it outbalances the good. It's both still exist. So I don't, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a, you can do so much good that people forget about your bad or it excuses the bad. I think it's just a uh, good job for the jobs. Maybe just cut out the other stuff. Right. <laughs> Don't do the other stuff because that's still wrong. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yep. This season messed me up, guys. It absolutely messed me up. Listen to it. It'll only take you a couple days to get through it. I'm more interested in maybe, it. and maybe this is for just a deeper conversation later when we see each other in a couple weeks as to why it messed you up so much. It seems like there was a really kind of easy, like, for me, I get to that place where Luke just was, where it's just like, yeah, you take the good, you know, you take the good from it and you leave the bad and you don't praise him. Yeah. I mean, everybody's going to have good and bad about them. So I, I guess I would want to know and not maybe not right now, but I would want to know what was so like, like what has caused you to be like, have to ponder this for so long. Um, I think it's the balance aspect that I am. I'm confused about on how. How the it's idea. the people that we as a society choose to promote and should we. There is another example, but it gets a bit too political for this show. So I'm holding off another example um, because there was another conversation that happened so at the post same time. So post this, we'll just have to dialogue we, about it. We I, will talk I'm, about it. I'm having a hard time understanding why it's a hard, why you're having a hard time. I guess that's And I don't know that I'm, and, and don't get me wrong, I, it, it's... It may not be me personally as much as it is kind of like, is it a societal problem that that we uh, allow allow these people to be role models for us? Like I it, in and again, we, there's there's actually two more examples that are also there, but both of them are a bit. It's a bit too much, so okay, I'll save sure. it. Great right. episode. Startup season four. So I think the current season's maybe season five. So again, it's not the latest season. Season four, episodes four through ten. Dove Charney, American Apparel, which is now he's starting LA Apparel. That's the thing. And if you have any thoughts, you can certainly send them my way. But Luke, go ahead and take it. All right. So I was lucky enough. Lenny graced me with my own category. Uh, and timing worked out perfect for me. So... um Talked about it. I think we mentioned this, man. I want to say it was beginning of the year, maybe. Yeah, it, ha that it had to have been. It had to have been six or seven months ago. I think so. Um, Andrew and I both backed a Kickstarter called Intenebris Lux, um, and it's a board game. Uh, it's Latin, roughly trans translated, uh, "Light in the Dark." And so the idea of this game is that you are an adventurer, an explorer, and you're exploring catacombs um, and trying to find artifacts and treasure and uh, defeat the darkness in the catacombs um, to win the game. And it's really cool because it's, uh, it's a game. So here's... Uh, okay, so it came in today. Um, here is the box. Uh, the box art is awesome. Uh, and I think what drew Andrew and I 
both to the game is the art style initially. Um, it is a card game. Uh, and what you do is it's similar to um, uh, Betrayal uh, House on Hill, House on Haunted Hill, uh, where you... Uh, betrayal at House on Haunted Hill? Yeah, that one. It's Betrayal at House on the Hill. Betrayal at House oh. on the Hill. Yes. That. I think Haunted Hill was an album. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Haunted uh, Hill. Is Haunted not Hill is a movie. It's fine. Yeah. Um, the House Good on point. Haunted Hill is a movie. It's not a great movie. Um, so, so the idea of this game is you create, you put these card, these room cards down, uh, and you put them together so that it makes your catacombs. Uh, and, and can the, you hold this up closer so I can see those yeah, cards? Sure. So it's it's all of these different kinds of rooms, and they connect through doorways and stuff. Uh, and you connect. You can it. keep talking. I'll sh- I'll show mine while you talk. That's fine. So that you don't. Have um, to- so it you you lay it down, and and that's how you make the catacombs. And then the characters travel tr- uh, travel through and find monsters and find items and battle monsters and uh, and there's a mechanic where. Uh, you're drawing these monsters and you're playing them on other people's turns to like slow them down and do different things. Um, very, very cool idea for a game. I really like it. It plays uh, one to four players uh, because of the Kickstarter success. It, it, I think originally it was, it was a $15,000 goal and it ended at like close to 35000 I think. Wow. Um, yeah, so they like added that. a ton of other cards. It's very cool. Uh, it has, oh, here they are. The, the character cards are these huge uh, cards. All kinds of different characters were added um, after the game, uh, after the Kickstarter success. Um, and it's cool because you get these items and these equipment. And so um, how it works is you have a head slot, you have um, a, a body slot, and a hand slot, and a, a pelvis slot. And that is where you place all of the um, equipment that you get throughout the game. And so you're, you're so actually, here's an equipment card. It's like a it's RPG. A helmet. It's like an RPG where you're going through and, and getting better gear for your characters to be able to fight these horrors down in the catacombs. Um, so that's a really cool idea. And then, uh, there's all of these, <laughs> for lack of a better term, tokens or pogs, uh, of all of the characters and all of the monsters and uh, you place them on the cards as you build the catacombs, and it has place markers. A lot of really cool ideas. Um, so the game came in. I'm super excited to play it. Very, very excited to play it because I like I like card games in general. I like RPGs. I like uh, this is kind of like a uh, steampunk esque kind of uh, style. It has some of the. Some of the item like, cards and stuff yeah. feel like Victorian era, yeah. like Eldritch Horror kind of thing, steampunk feel. Uh, I really like that. It's, it was hitting all of the things for me, and the art is great. I got it in, and I'm a little underwhelmed. So I feel like um, I feel like so they asked for a fifteen thousand dollar goal. That's what they set it at. They got thirty four, a little almost thirty five. Sure. And it feels like um, I've never kickstarted a game, obviously. I don't know how it works with uh, running into printing and all of this stuff and all the pieces they, they have. It feels a little bit like they cut some corners um, or made some poor choices in uh, their printing decisions or something like that. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Because you you held that up to the camera and it was it's hard. I mean, I obviously can't feel it. Right. The the card stock does it feel like nice playing cards yeah. or or no? No. Yeah. No, I what? don't. I don't think I. They're they're nice. Like they're decent cards, but so it's going to be really hard to tell. That's probably the best I can show you. Every card has this texture kind of look, it, and you see kind of like a square pattern. Uh, it's going to be really hard for people to see on the youtube uh i'm trying to because get... i'll i'll say this like hero I'm complex gonna compare them to the uh to the campy creatures cards right so i i believe it was hero complex gallery that put out the deck of cards correct right that was like all the posters right and uh and i remember that that i was let down with those because they didn't go with a high quality card stock. so the really nice playing cards are actually two 
pieces right. of um, whatever that pulp material is, sure. and there's a glue between them. And, and the thing that keeps you from seeing through is actually the glue. Right. And then, um, and and so it's they have to be pretty heavy because they have to be two layers, right. like a glue layer. And the stuff that Hero Complex had, it almost felt like it was half a card. Like it didn't feel like a full weight card. And they like stuck to each other weird. And I just remember thinking like, man, this was such a cool thing. And if only you had gone with a little bit nicer weight. Sure. Um, but that being said, cards are expensive. So, right. so, so I don't so feel... Just, can I ahead. say this? Just yeah. showing you. Um, I'm, I was just applying the same amount of pressure to the to these two to these two cards yeah and um this one this one definitely takes a little bit more bend yeah um this one has that same texture that this one has they both have the same texture Is but it this kind one of feels a like it's maybe kind of feel like it you yeah. can see like the yeah. square texture in it mm -hmm. okay um but I think this is probably like a seven. Uh, this is this one. The uh, the Intenebris Lux card is about seventy five percent the weight of this one. Right. Okay. So it feels a little bit more flimsy. Right. So it it's hard. So um, so that was a little surprising. It feels a little bit flimsy. And then just the overall design. There is some very very intricate um, design in the back of these cards, and it's yeah. it's really really nice. Like it. It's very, very cool. And then the front of the cards, even just the design of, of some of uh, the, the weapons, the, the artwork on them, incredible. The artwork on like the old, the great old one um, is a, is a yeah. horror. Looks, That's literally what I yeah, just was holding up. <laughs> looks amazing. Like, I love it. Um, I feel like some of the design in the cards themselves and, and the, the readability was not fully thought through. So like um, some of the text of certain cards on like what, uh, what you do, what, what abilities some things have, it's really hard to read because of what they chose to put in the artwork behind it. Right, yeah. Um, it almost feels like you could have done kind of maybe like a magic card and kept like a separate box underneath. Um, I, don't, I mean, I know that would change the design completely, but yeah. it's really hard... You pull a card up, you have to take an extra second to really look at it to see what it says. It's hard to see at a glance what that card I think, does. I think it's I think it's honestly, I think it's more than anything, I think it's the font choice. Right. Because it's a very thin font. Right. And then they have chosen to outline that font with black. Right. If they had and they it looks like they attempted to do a gradient behind it. So you can uh -huh. see there's a, a black gradient behind it, but sure. I don't think it was executed as well as yeah, as, as far as efficiency. And let sake. me say, let me say this. Uh, so all a lot of these cards you can see as I, like I'm looking through them. A lot of them have that gradient at the bottom right. for re, for legibility. Um, I let me say this. All of these things I'm saying are super nitpicky. I'm super excited to play this game, and I have not played it yet. I will play it, and I'm sure I will love it because, like I said, it hits it hits everything for me. The 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 game design. The artwork, the style, I love it all. Um, the, these are things... The box itself is actually really sturdy. Yeah, the box is great. Like, these yeah. these icons, so they added they added this piece um, after some playtest feedback to, so you can see the characters because everything is placed on the cards so you know where your characters are in the board and people were having a hard time distinguishing their explorers. So they added these pieces. I think that's a really cool move for them to like be reactive and pay the extra money to make the the game experience better um, without without upcharging everybody. Exactly, who already that's it. super right. awesome. These, so I'm holding up. Uh, I think I'm holding up three different pieces, and uh, and I only nope, think you're that, holding up four different pieces. Uh, four. No, I mean like three different types of tokens. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, and I only know that by the border. I wish that maybe instead of this cream background for all of them, they mm. would have made them uh, similar. Color-coded. Well, color-coded to the back of the card, to whatever the yeah. card was uh, that, that it corresponds with. Um, so those are like... They tried to keep everything, though, in, like, earth tones. Right. So, like, it's kind of hard, because I think they've got, like, five or six different kinds of cards. Right. And they're all trying to stay in the earth, like, earth tone, like, browns and khakis. And unless you... Like if you are colorblind, you're gonna have a very difficult time. Well, the distinguishing back of the cards, the cards, there's red, there's blue, there's a purple. Those are pretty easy to see. Um, 
but I would like to see the other side, those tokens to match, because I feel like that's going to be a hard thing to learn. It's just adding an, an element of learning to the game of you're going to have to learn what the token uh, perimeter design is and stuff Here's like that. Here's what I'm hearing. What I'm hearing is that the game should be a lot of fun, but I have to wait until you play test it or just play it. Yeah. B, you if it. you have a cat that doesn't have a home, the box is a it's very great. good home. Hey, Luca, do you, have you been reading all the updates and things? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so one thing I just noticed, they have on the, on the box itself, there is no UPC anywhere on right. here. It's pretty generic as far as that's concerned. Right. And like, as opposed to this can't be creatures box, which sure. um, is already set and ready to go to be re like sell at retail. Right. Um, or with retailers. Do we know if this is ever going to go to retailers? I don't know if they have a publisher or not. I don't, okay. I don't think they have a publisher yet. I think it was just kickstarted and they put it out. Um, there is, uh, I'm going to get the, I'm going to look at the back here. I'm going to get the game company, right? It's golden age games is the, is the people that made it. Um, and I think they are probably from based from what you just said, they're still looking for a publisher. I could yeah. be wrong. They could have it, but as of right maybe now, maybe these were just the, uh, Kickstarter boxes. Absolutely. And it could be yeah. that case where they're pushing out the Kickstarter and then they're going to refine design for a retail release. That could be it. Yeah. Um, cool. I'm super excited to play it. Some yeah. really, really cool stuff. I love the idea of building the board as you go from the cards you draw. Um, some very cool mechanics. It's kind of like a, uh, there's like grit and wit and, uh, like a charisma. Spit. No, yeah. it's like a, it's paper, rock, scissors of like what beats what. Um, it's got that mechanic in it for like your power leveling. Very fun idea. Uh, it should be a very awesome game. I just am being a little bit nitpicky with the design because I was super excited to play it and see it. And then when I saw it, I was like, oh, it's a little underwhelming. The art is still fantastic. I just wish the packaging was a little bit more coherent. Well, good thing in this world, gameplay defeats all. Gameplay trumps everything. Doesn't matter. Could I mean, eh. look at... No, it does. No, look that, at Dominion. it does. It does. Look at Dominion. Nope. Dominion? One of the it's best, a great example. One of the yeah, best. Yeah, but I will. Building. I will never play Dominion. It'll never stay on my shelf. I think you are a. I think you are a very minuscule portion of of a game. Well, that's really hurtful. Big. Well, sorry. That's hurtful. I think it's true. I think. I think your reasoning why you won't buy it is is very uh, is not normal. Dominion um, looks disgusting. It does. It, does. it looks like someone threw it up. It is one of the very very best deck building games ever. It's just, yeah. it, it just, so why not is. just go through the process of, of redesigning it? So because then you have to redesign all this the has, expansions. So yeah, many I understand. expansions. It's not cost effective. It makes no sense. Huh? Yeah. Then you're not getting my money. Well, yeah. I think you okay just lost that. a sale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From a sale. Uh, but yeah, that's it. So I would say still, if you can get the game, still get it because it's going to be a great game to play. Um, it literally, I mean, it just came out to kick to backers so it'll probably be a while before it's available yeah. to and anybody hit, else but yeah that, that's the other thing i want to say that they hit their delivery day like they yeah. said by september 2017 they wanted to have people uh, have it in your hands and they did yeah that's amazing because i've you heard still have stories. kickstarters that you bought two years ago you've never gotten <laughs> no that's not true most of yeah, that he, he has a beard been. trimmer that he ordered <laughs> six years ago i'm still waiting that's, i'm ready to cut he's this just waiting possible. because he he took he took it to heart when they said <laughs> you you should never use any other beard trimmer right. so he right. hasn't and he's just been waiting for this one <laughs> uh but yeah all right it's gonna be a good game all right you handed it over to yeah, me man it's all you take it all right well let's close this thing out then um Kingsman is a film that we saw two years ago. Yeah. That one came out three years ago. Yeah. Probably. Um, the original. But uh, with Kingsman, we saw it was a, kind of a bit of a uh, James Bond meets um, other fun stuff. Okay. <laughs> uh, James Bond well meets um, uh, Pulp Fiction. There you go. Okay. Uh, that's the kind of that's the kind of uh, it's kind of Tarantino esque, but it's a spy espionage film. Um, so Kingsman Two, but billed as Kingsman: The Golden Circle, oh. um, just released last week. And uh, man, 
It was hyped, a pr- you know, quite a bit. Yeah. The first film was was well, amazing the first and one was excellent. So good. It was so good. Yes. So the second one, uh, to uh, to to everybody's, um, I mean, everybody was super excited about seeing this. Yeah. It was a big budget, uh, big budget film, and so. And star studded, like so right. many they people added, jam yeah. packed into this movie. It's just ridiculous. Um, and so I'll just run through just real quick some of the people. So Julianne Moore, um, Colin Firth. Uh, oh my gosh, what's his name? I'm totally blanking. Um, yes, Jeff Good Bridges, yes. Channing Tatum, yes. um, Halle Berry. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, obviously, all the people who were in the original, the Taron Egerton. Um, oh, Edward Holcroft plays a huge role in this as Charlie. So nice. what ends up happening in this film is uh, without – and I'm not going to give any spoilers, but uh, but what you've been able to tell from the from the trailers is the Kingsmen get blown up. They're yeah. – their headquarters and presumably most, if not all, of their um, agents. Of their, their what's the agents? Like the agents. Agents. Yeah. Um, get get blown up. Because in the preview, you see them flicker and go out. Yeah, flicker they right. flicker go and go out. out. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm only gonna tell you things that happened in the trailer, and then and I'll I just haven't give you seen a it. So if you say something that's wrong, I'm gonna lose it. How would you know if it's wrong? I'm gonna lose this. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm gonna lose this. But, <laughs> But uh, uh, so what they end up having to do is they they kind of go to this this backup plan. It's kind of like a a, a doomsday plan, if you will, that connects oh, no. them with their American cousins, essentially, which are called the Statesmen. So you had the Kingsmen, you have the Statesmen, and the Statesmen um, they are headquartered in. So every so I mean so these these kind of. Um, off the books government agencies right. or like these private agencies are uh, they they all have fronts right so like the front for Kingsman was this tailor right this mm-hmm. this tailor shop um, so what happens over in the Statesman they are they are housed in this t- uh, Kentucky whiskey um, distillery or whatever they're called the the these sure. places that make that's uh, that's whiskey. what it's called a distillery good so. Um, so they go over there and it's a totally different like everyone is everybody is is trained the same kind of like high intensity like super high impact very clever smart fighting styles all these different things but you have this whole new cast of characters um which are like cowboy-esque like what you would think as like quintessential Americans you know they've got these belt buckles and cowboy hats and um they all sit around the table instead of with tea and glasses. They sit around the table with cigars and whiskey, nice. right? So, yep. um, but it's really fun. Like the whole, so the, the film is them trying to figure out who did this and get back at the person who did this. Julianne Moore plays the the main uh, the main bad guy, the main uh, antagonist of the film. She owns this this company called Poppy's. Uh, Poppy something or other, but she lives on this island and she essentially is a drug dealer, a, a, a global drug dealer. And so she lives on this island off, you know, off the radar from people. And then she has drug cartel all over the world. Hmm. Um, but uh, I'm not going to tell you, but there's a bigger story other than just what happens with the Kingsman being destroyed. There's a bigger thing at large where they have to save the world. Right. And um, and she's actually ensues. on the current season of Dancing with the Stars in the show. And she has a plot for destroying the ballroom during the finale. It's really right. spectacular. It is. It's great. And then you got Tom Berger on. <laughs> and he's um, great. And he's just great in anything that he's in. (laughs) That or um, American Funny Host Home Videos. I struggled through that. But but then I think those are the only two things he's ever done. So he's great in both things. He's batting Um, a thousand. Yeah. But uh, anyway, yeah. So I'm not going to say anything about it. I'm going to I'll talk about what my feelings were of the film. Um, It didn't hit on the, the full... You know, I, w- I went into this film expecting that it to be a 10 because Kingsman was a 10 for me. Yeah. It was unexpected. It was different. Um, and it was it was fun. This film is um, it's just as fun, but it's not as unexpected. There's a little bit where sure. it's like it, it kind of it, it feels like the first Kingsman in a lot of ways. Um it's one of those things like, can you actually capture lightning in a bottle again? It's like Anchorman versus Anchorman 2. Literally kind of what I was thinking. Exactly. So, yeah. um, 
But that doesn't, uh, to me, that doesn't take away from the overall story of the of the film. But it does take away from my rating. So I think I'd probably give it an eight. Um, and uh, yeah, I would give it a solid eight. But totally uh, worth a watch. Totally worth a watch. It's very very fun. Um, you know, you're not going to necessarily see uh, a whole a whole cacophony of heads exploding into colorful. I like that uh, word. Yeah. What? Cacophony. That's a good word. Oh, you like I that? Thought, it's a triple yeah, word. Hey, now I that we're on video, I've word. really, I've really, I started reading uh, That's the. That's perfect for an audio podcast. I was going to say that probably would have made more Great. sense w- when we're we were good. talking the last the thing three is, years. The thing is, though, I I need to not feel like I look stupid. <laughs> oh, you're doing great. <laughs> so I have two um, questions. I do have yeah. two questions. Yeah, go for it. A, you look stupid. How bummed are I like the frame rate of this? A, how bummed are you that the Colin Fur thing was given away? Uh, not terribly bummed because that happens very early in the film. Okay. It's not a major Fair. plot point. He, there, there's elements of it that's a major plot point that I'm not going to give anything away, but him showing up in the movie was pretty early on, within like the first 20 minutes of the movie. All right. B, second question. I've heard this movie described as a bit more of a footballer uh, comedy uh, or that style of humor than the previous film. There is a specific scene that has been kind of cited as maybe going too far. And in okay, fact, give, give one, an exa- yeah, give an example of what that scene is without like explaining the whole scene. Just give me enough so that I would know what you're talking about. So I can tell you whether I agree. There's a or tracking not. device being. Oh yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And I, I've actually heard one, um, one movie reviewer describe that scene as like unforgivable. What oh, are your no, thoughts? No, 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 no. I don't think it's unforgivable. I think it's, it, it plays what they do. So I don't know who, the, so the, the director's name is uh, Matthew um, Vaughn. Okay. Nope. Modine. Uh, Matthew Vaughn. I don't oh. know where he's from. Um, let me see. He is, he, he's an English film producer. Okay. So he's a, so he's English. It definitely has like a hyper real version of what America is like. Um, it's kind of like it's kind of like the episode of Arrested Development where he goes to to Wee Britain and they go to the American restaurant see, yeah. and they serve everything with like a thirty six ounce soda you know soda pops or whatever. It, it's a little hyper real, so in that sense, uh, I, I think you you forgive some of it because it's satirical on America in mm. some ways. So no, I don't think it's unforgivable. It's there was so there was a uh, like an eight year old girl or nope nope. That was a different film. There was a like eleven year old boy sitting right next to me, and that was a little uncomfortable because there were some sexual, you know, elements to this movie, and like why this guy brought his eleven year old son to this movie. It's rated R, and it's 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 a pretty decently hard R. Um, the language is terrible, and there's a ton of violence, and then some sexual stuff. So, um, but no, it's not unforgivable. It's it's yeah. It, it is what it is. It's it's not unlike what happened with the the scissor or the uh, the the sword leg lady from the first one it's just a different kind of that's the part that makes it tarantino-esque kind of this like over the top weird thing sure Uh that that was one of those elements but no it was not unforgivable at all okay um but anyway i would say go see see it it. go see it in theaters it's loud it's it's fast it's fun um it's definitely a a, a movie you want to see in theaters uh, yeah. to take advantage of like the the full experience, um, but uh, I'd totally see it again. So cool. it's a cool. it's a good addition to the franchise. All right, I think uh, we're gonna go ahead and call that one done. That's it for this episode. You can find us at m of one podcast.com where you can find show notes and links to all the stuff we just talked about. If you're watching this on YouTube, just look at all that stuff below us. <laughs> uh, leave a comment below. Like it. Share it. Um, Become friends with us. Subscribe. subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. It helps you never miss an episode. And it helps us out a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're listening to this, you can find that at m of one or at uh, youtube.com slash m of one podcast. You can find our Slack channel to join the conversation in there. Go to m of one podcast.com slash Slack uh, to find any number of things. Do m of one podcast to just find us. Just yeah. type that in and you'll it's find all on us. the screen right below us. You'll see it. Yeah, everything is, is around. If you're watching this, it's right here. Um, and uh, again, uh, man, 
join the conversation. We've asked several questions. We posed several different things in this episode. We love Slack. We love the community. We love to, to field questions and to engage with you guys. So engage with us. We're on all the different social platforms. Find us on there. But I think for now, we're going to go ahead and hop out of this one. I'm Andrew. I'm Patrick. And I'm Luke. Peace out. Bye. Hold on to this. Welcome to another episode of the Master of One podcast, the podcast that's like a bottle of Kentucky whiskey. We get better every year. I'm partly here. (laughs) True. (laughs) Oh, wait, this part's not on video, is it? No. Then why am I reacting like it is? Yeah, okay. I'm like doing with my shoulders and my face. Here we go. Being expressive. Here we go. Here we go.